Um, we have uh, one hour uh, only, it's a shorter workshop than usual, um, to uh, tell you a little bit about the principles. If you haven't heard of them, you can grab a copy of them on the table on the, uh, at the back. Um, the English language version actually hasn't made its way into the room. There are some <coughs> copies floating around at the IGF, but I don't have them yet. Hopefully they may make their way here. Um, otherwise, there are um, six other languages and also a background paper in English. And also we have some stickers, so please do visit that table at the back to grab your copies of the Manila Principles and associated paraphernalia. Oh, and uh, here comes the, the man of the day, Danny O'Brien, with the English language Manila Principles. So thank you very much, uh, Danny. And you can grab the English language principles from that box. Uh, uh, and, and Danny is, is coming around with them as well. So uh, without any further ado, I am going to pass on to Jyoti Pandey from the Centre for Internet and Society, India. And she is going to give an overview of the Manila Principles. Thank you very much, Jyoti. Thanks, Jeremy. Good afternoon. Well, good morning. Um, so the Manila principles were um, developed as a best practices guide for government, industry, and civil society um, to develop, uh, to guide how regimes and frameworks for liability and the regulation of online intermediaries for online content is to guide these practices. Um, the six principles are, and I'll just quickly read them before I get into uh, the process and the background of how we actually develop the principles. Um, so there are six principles, and each of the principles then subdivide into certain other um, nuances that need to be considered within each of the best practices that we've identified. Um, the first principle is that intermediaries should be shielded by law from liability for third party content. Um, the second states that content must not be required to be restricted without an order by a judicial authority. Um, the third principle states that requests for restrictions of content must be clear, unambiguous, and follow due process. Uh, we've then considered um, the tests of necessity and proportionality, and the fourth uh, principle uh, states that laws and content restriction orders need to comply with, these, with this test. Um, the fifth principle goes, considers, again, due process, and uh, we have stated that laws and content restriction policies um, must follow due process. And fi the final principle considers transparency and accountability. Each principle, as I mentioned earlier, has subsidiary points um, that expand on the theme of each of the principles. Um, and just giving you a brief background on how we develop this so this is initially a civil society um, initiative, and we had um, Electronic Frontier Foundation, Article 19, and Center for Internet and Society that came together. We also then expanded, and uh, we had um, um, Kitanet from Kenya, uh, Dero Shows Digitalis from Chile, um, ADC from Argentina, and OpenNet South Korea, and we had experts from, and representatives from each of these organizations that came together and worked on an initial draft. This draft was then circulated to a larger audience of academics and people who have been engaging with this, with these issues for very many years, and they, we got their feedback on what should be, how we can improve that draft. And after an extensive public consultation period, which ran both over mailing lists and at various internet governance venues, um, we finally launched at the Manila um, RightsCon meeting, as Jeremy mentioned. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of diversity of uh, the countries, um, another important aspect that informed our development of these principles was a jurisdictional analysis, where each of the organizations, the countries um, that they uh, work in, we looked at the liability regimes that are applicable or in place, and we developed a set of criteria um, that would guide the issues uh, and the best practices, helped us identify the best practices across each of those regimes. And uh, there's a copy of the jurisdictional analysis along with um, the set of principles that are there in front of you. Um, I'll just pass on. So I'm happy to answer any more questions on the process after the session. Thanks, Jeremy. 
Thank you very much. You're ahead of time, so uh, we're going to have more time for interaction, which is great. Um, I'm going to hand on to Kelly Kim, uh, who's going to talk about um, the advocacy and outreach activities uh, that we've engaged in uh, around the principles since they were first released. So, Kelly. Can you turn the PowerPoint on? So, um, our Open Net Korea is an NGO um, fighting for digital rights in Korea, and our my presentation will focus on our efforts uh, for advocacy and outreach and research activities um, in Korea. So I'm Kelly from Open Net Korea. I'm a general counsel. Um, so um, this is, um, I don't know whether any of you already visited, oh, okay, already visited the website. So this is the web page. And it is very great uh, because the, that the principles in like nine languages so you can also find like Korean version on the website. So this is very helpful in advocacy. Um, so it, it is very important to make you know, this information available in many languages if, uh, if you want to have this principle on international impact. And so here are like six principles and Jody already uh, mentioned them. So, so now we, we see how, how Manila principle can be applied to Korean notice and takedown regimes. So there are six uh, principles. Oops, okay, I forgot to. So six principles. And then this is a like, small um, table. So in Korea, we have Copyright Act, Article 103, and then Information and Communication Network Act. Article 44-2. So this is uh, there are printouts on your table, so you, um, which is titled a letter to the members of the parliament. So detailed information is in the handout, so you can just check the handout to see the provisions that I'm mentioning here. So there are like six principles, main principles. So first is inter. First, so and six principles and the color shows like blue color means it complies with the principle. Um, orange color is like red, yellow color, like so it's like it's dubious whether it's like in breach of the principle or not. And red colored columns are clearly in breach of breach of the principle. So um, first. The principle says intermediaries should should be shielded. Uh, so our Copyright Act gives like complete immu immunity to intermediaries, whereas our Information and Communication Network Act gives only partial immunity. So intermediary uh, intermediaries are um, are liable, can be held liable even if um, they take contents down. Um, and second is like content restriction requires judicial order. So like in Copyright Act, um, intermediaries has no obligation. They only take down contents, I mean, when there is a request from copyright holders. Um, so if they, it's so it is act, it acts as a safe harbor. So if the intermediary, intermediary takes down the contents, then it won't be held liable. And so it's like no obligation, but whereas um, Information Communication Network Act Im imposes intermediaries liability when when it does not take the content down, and the in and there is no court in intervention here. So it's up to intermediaries to decide whether to take the contents down or not. And if they don't con take down the content, even if the content is lawful, they can be held liable. And third is um, registration request. So our copyright um, act follows DMCA's notice and takedown very detail in detail. So it's okay, but like if you want to take down any contents under ICNA, you can just present any material supporting um, supporting your your argument. And fourth, um, test of necessity and proportionality. So when a use, when a copyright holder requests uh, requests takedown of the content, 
Uh, the law says um, suspension, so there are rooms for other like technical measures, you know, to, so like the intermediate don't need to delete the content itself. I mean, intermediates can uh, take other measures to suspend um, reproduction or transmission, whereas under ICNA, intermediates must delete the content from the from the server app. And, and temporary measures is also deletion. It only gives like three, 30 days blind period. And FIPS is like laws, orders, practices should follow the process. Um, so under copyright act, like, like notice and take down of the MCA, uh, the, the person who got their content um, taken down can request resumption of reproduction or transmission, whereas under um, ICNA, um, the post, the one who posted the, the content have, has no right or no, yeah, no right to request resumption. And transparency and accountability, that's very ambitious goal, so they have no, nothing about like transparency or accountability. Okay, so, so how this was, so this is like detailed uh, provision of information and communication network act. So if any, any content uh, seems to in intrude on other people's privacy or defames other persons or violate other persons right otherwise, it's very broad. So the, the right, in, I mean the person who make the request can just allege that um, this content it has, oops, sorry, has this problem and then just request the intermediary to take the content down and the intermediary must follow the request and just delete the content from just completely. So we, we thought this, this is a like huge problem and huge infringement on, um, on the money the principles. So actually Jeremy Marcom visited Korea in July and helped us advocating against this provision by using this money in the principles. And this letter is what we uh, circulated between the net, our network um, and our people so that they, we can, they can help us to change the law according to Manila principles. And we also, um, this, we also br brought this to a, a, a Pacific region, IGF in Macau, which was held in June. And we got many signatures and many approvals of our letters. But still, it's going on. We, we, okay. And we also proposed a bill to, with our members of parliament. Um, and we are fighting to change the law. And Manila principle comes in, comes in very handy when we advocate um, to the people or to the MPs or, yes, our relevant multi-stakeholders that this law is against Manila principles and that we must change the law. Okay, and next is like filtering obligation. So money in the principles, um, rule one A is, is it A? Okay, rule one says that um, intermediaries should never be, um, is it? Yes, um, intermediaries should, should not be uh, required to monitor contents. So like we have, a, like in Korea, we have many, many filtering obligations under law. So for example, like Copyright Act, Article 104, says um, you know, intermediaries must take necessary measures, such as technical measures. Uh, that means like monitoring and filtering of like copyright infringing materials. So it imposes such an obligation to intermediaries. And if the intermediaries um, does not follow, I mean, breach the law, it will be fined for like, 30 million won, which is like two, 33,000 US dollars. And we also consider this a violation, Korea EU FTA and violation of mining the principles. So we also propose the bill um, to repeal the law according to mining the principles. And um, it, it's still pending at the parliament. 
And next is we also have another law, which is Telecommunication Business Act, and it imposes filtering obligation for obscene materials. So it different from copyrighted materials, I mean, copyright works are very clear. I mean, they have right holders and um, you know, you can tell whether it's copyright work or not. But when, in, when you have to filter like obscene materials, it's very dubious. Like, um, then, so the intermediaries must implement technical measures prescribed by President's decree to, uh, to filter those obscene materials. And those technical measures are like keyword filtering or uh, any measures that can detect obscene materials by the title or its features. So it's like if um, the title of the material includes like sex or what else, whatever, um, it, it should be filtered. So it's a very broad obligation. So it's also um, in violation of Manila principles. And, it, and the intermediate can, be also, can also be fined. Um, next is, this one is very serious obligation. This is another filtering obligation for child pawns. Okay, of course, we, we, should, we should never ever allow intermediaries or anyone to like, spread child pawns, but this provision Im imposes ob obligation on intermediaries to filter those children child pornography. Um, with the same technical measures like copyright materials or obscene materials like keyword filtering or any um, technical measure that can detect a child pawns, maybe DNA um, filtering or something. So, and there's no guideline. And if intermediaries violate this provision, um, it can be, even the person, I mean, even the intermediary can be imprisoned for three years or like fined for like 20 million won. Okay, uh, it has been, it hasn't been used yet so far, but then, um, like this, okay, sorry, I'm sorry. So um, this month, as former CEO of Dam Kakao, he was indicted under that um, Article 17 um, because um, this Kakao Talk is most popular um, social network service, messaging service in Korea, and there were some people like sharing these child pawns on their on their messaging messaging app, and then his, the CEO was um, indicted for not um, properly filtering or preventing um, circulation of the child pawns on on this platform. So this. This was very serious. Um, so, so we we are the only organization um, advocating for um, the CEO, and like this is in Korean. Um, this is a news article about this and Manila principles. It mentions Jeremy Markham, and it also mentions our director K S Park. Um, that like this indictment is against Manila principles, and intermediaries should never be held liable for not detecting or not filtering um, child pawns. And next is uh, our research activities. So, so Manila principles uh, inspired um, network, center, network of centers, online intermediate research project, which is, it says like good protects, practice documents. Um, and this was inspired by also Manila principles. So you may go to the website and check the good practices out. It will be very helpful. Okay, thank you. Cool. Hello, thank you very much, uh, Kelly. And um, there's some other outreach that we may have a chance to talk about um, uh, at the end of the session, uh, such as in Europe, where of course there are moves to crack down on intermediaries or to impose additional responsibilities on them, which could impinge on uh, freedom of expression and freedom of association online. So um, we may get to that if we have time at the end. Uh, but right now I'm going to move on to um, Gabrielle from Article 19, who's going to talk about a new project under the auspices of the Manila Principles that we're um, uh, extending our work in at the moment, and uh, you can find out from her about how uh, what that is and how to participate. Thanks, Gabrielle. Thanks very much, Jeremy. 
I mean, first, I'd like to explain why we think that it's important to have a template uh, notice of content restriction. As you know, there are broadly three models for restricted um, content online. The first is a court-based model, whereby the intermediary is required to restrict access to content uh, when ordered to do so by a court. The second model is also known as the safe harbor model, which is also the notice and take down regime, whereby an intermediary must receive actual knowledge of illegal content and then take action to restrict it. And as we'll see, notice is particularly important in that particular context. And the third model is the notice and notice regime, whereby the intermediary is pretty much removed from the dispute about content because the purpose of this regime is really to put the dispute back in the hands of the content producer and the person complaining about it. But the intermediary has an obligation to transfer the notice. So why then is notice important? It's because at least in the context of the safe harbor regime, notice and takedown, or the notice and notice uh, regime, the, the notice itself can trigger exposure to liability. So this is why uh, we decided to put together um, a new form on content restriction. Another important aspect of the notice regime is in relation to terms and conditions because in addition to the legal requirements, intermediaries can restrict content on the basis of their terms of service. Most of the time, this can be done by either flagging content or you know, pressing a report button and reporting. The concern here is that a lot of the time, individuals will just have to press the button and there'll be no explanation as to why there's a problem with the content itself. So the idea behind the form is to go through these different types of regimes and terms and conditions and design a template whereby individuals who want to complain about a particular piece of content must explain why they think it's problematic. When it is in relation to a legal issue, they would have to explain the legal basis, why they think, for example, that material is defamatory. In the context of terms and conditions, they would have to give more of an explanation as to why they think it's in breach of the intermediary's terms of service. So that's pretty much the approach we're taking at the moment in the template. The template itself is not yet publicly available. We're working on it, and, but it will be published soon and we'll be seeking feedback. But I'll just end here by um, asking you to think about whether you think that putting together such a template is something that is useful and what the best approach would be um, for dealing with it. Should we focus on all the different types of regimes or should we design specific forms, for example, for the notice and notice regime as opposed to notice and take down or as opposed to um, should we consider, for instance, should we have also a template when it comes to the court-based model? Uh, since, in principle, the restriction needs to happen on the basis of the court order itself. Nonetheless, would it be useful to, to, to have um, a particular template to at least alert uh, the person complaining that um, nothing will be done until a court order has been received? So these are questions we'd like to throw at you, and we'll be consulting on this further on. Thank you. Well, so how can people um, get in further information from us uh, if they're interested? You can contact all of us, effectively. Um, so um, there's um, me at Article 19, um, Jeremy, Open Net Korea, um, NCIS India, pretty much uh, the founding, uh, the, the members of the steering committee. And um, is there... Yes, you can. You can also um, go to our website, and there's a link uh, to line up, uh, to join up to a public mailing list if you if you wish to. So um, many ways for you to remain in touch and involved. Um, so uh, those were the introductory presentations, and now we're going to open up into a roundtable discussion with uh, some friends and experts. Um, we have Rebecca McKinnon, who's uh, in in the extended version of this table over there because she has to leave early, so she's. Uh, <laughs> 
she's hedging her bets and staying over there. Um, <laughs> Giancarlo Frosia, who's uh, at the end. Uh, we have um, Nicolò Zangales, who's at the other end. Um, we have um, Marcel Leonardi from Google, and um, they can tell, the, tell us a little bit more about themselves as they um, give their remarks. And we're going to hopefully be able to uh, jump around. Uh, also, um, just checking, Ed, um, Eduardo Bertoni is not in the room, is he? No, okay, that's fine. Um, so they're going to give a few remarks about uh, either the associated work that they've been doing on intermediary liability um, or the um, impacts of the, oh dear, the impacts of the Manila principles on their work. So um, uh, we're going to uh, then, after that uh, panel roundtable, we're then going to open up for questions and comments from the audience. So the rest of this session should be much more interactive than the first half. So uh, since Rebecca has to go, I might uh, start with her. If you have any comments, Rebecca. Would you like to? Yeah, the, it's working. Okay, so no, I'll let you go. Okay, um, thanks, and thanks for letting me kind of lurk on the edges here. Um, my name is Rebecca McKinnon. I'm, I'm director of the Ranking Digital Rights Project. Um, and we um, evaluated 16 companies, eight internet companies, eight telecommunications companies uh, operating around the world on their policies and practices affecting freedom of expression and privacy of users. And uh, our freedom of expression section overlaps particularly with uh, principle six of the Manila principles on transparency and accountability. So I thought I would mention a, a, a few of the findings that I think are relevant and that might kind of help add some fodder to the, the broader discussion about transparency around requests um, in particular and, and about laws and about practices. So um, in our um, in, in our section where we um, examined companies on indicators, asking questions about companies' policies and practices affecting users' freedom of expression, we had a question uh, about whether companies uh, disclose any information about their process for responding to third-party requests, be they from governments or private actors, including DMCA takedowns and whatnot. Uh, and out of the um, uh, 16 companies, uh, eight companies publish some information to varying degrees about their, their practices and, and policies. Uh, just for responding to requests, not not including data about the requests themselves. And this included uh, some but not all of the internet companies and and a couple of, of the telcos, um, Vodafone and AT&T being the two telcos that, that uh, disclose information. Um, and then when it comes to reporting data about requests, we, we had one indicator asking about whether companies report data in, in other words, numbers of government requests that they receive to take down or restrict content. Um, only six companies report any data numbers about the number of requests they receive from governments and courts. Um, when it comes to private requests, there's even less transparency. Which so private requests in our kind of taxonomy, we include you know notice and takedown in the private request as well as people flagging content. Um, and only four companies report any data about private requests that they receive. And in general, while there are quite a lot of places where laws are restricting or 
perhaps preventing companies from reporting about government requests. Generally, the laws are not preventing companies from reporting private requests, yet there's a lot less reporting on this, a lot less transparency about private requests. So this is something to flag and, and, and perhaps something that the, the Manila Principles Coalition might want to really push for intermediaries to do. And I would note, since we, we have our, our friend from Korea uh, on the panel and that OpenNet's been doing a lot of work in this area, that Kakao, uh, the Korean company that she mentioned earlier, was one of the one of the companies we included in our index, and they do in fact report on at least some private requests. So that's that's kind of worth noting. Another final note is that um, when it comes to enforcing terms of service, which would include enforcing, you know, when co when companies are sort of of their own initiative taking down content, um, including. Uh, in, including things like images they think are copyrighted that, you know, so anticipating uh, that they will be held liable for this material and taking it down even if they don't receive requests. Um, there is zero data, zero numbers reported by any of the companies studied on terms of service removals and restrictions. Um, that that are you know done internally, not in response to requests, but just voluntarily by the companies. Um, so that points to a real deficit in in transparency, um, and that that perhaps is uh, preventing um, understanding of what's going on. Um, and and so I would recommend perhaps kind of trying to push for that. And of course, government transparency about this. And then one other point to make then I'll hand it over to others, um, is that there, that not very many companies are, uh, are, are then posting sort of the, the content of requests onto third-party sites like Chilling Effects. It's really only a couple, a, a very tiny handful of companies that are doing that, basically three in our sample anyway. There are some other smaller companies that, that do it. But, um, Based on our understanding, in some in a number of jurisdictions, it's actually not legal for companies to use a mechanism like chilling effects to to be transparent about the content of orders they're receiving. Um, so that's another place, perhaps, for legal ad advocacy and and pushes push for legal reform. That when you have a lot of places, and I, and I think Kelly can can correct me if I'm wrong. I think Korea is one of them where a chilling effects type site would not be possible because because of the law and that's that's a concern so and uh have a good flight uh, as you move off um so i'm going to uh hopefully not surprise him too much but marcel i'm going to uh, call on you because um of course google is one of the companies that does report um uh, it's takedown notices that it receives to chilling effects or lumen databases, I think it's called now. Um, but what about the other aspect that uh, Rebecca mentioned about terms of service removals? Is that an area in which we can see some uh, some further disclosures by Google in the future? What do you think? There has certainly been some progress internally discussing that kind of issue. Uh, usually what happens when these private disclosures show up is they either involve very sensitive issues or they're a clear violation of the terms of service. So I guess there wasn't really a specific push to actually present that kind of data. So I'm really glad to hear now there's demand for that kind of transparency. Uh, in addition to that question, I think I'd like to quickly highlight, uh, I think Brazil is a very interesting case study on intermediary, intermediary liability and how uh, the Manila principles have a very close dialogue with them, with it. Uh, and the reason being is, uh, for quite a while here, uh, there was no specific immunity for intermediaries. So essentially, the legal system at first uh, imposed strict liability on intermediaries, meaning that just because you offer an online service, essentially you would liable for whatever users were doing. Uh, after a few years, I would say maybe four or five, uh, uh, courts start imposing uh, 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 how can I call this, uh, a different standard of liability, especially like notice and takedown, but the problem is they adopted notice and takedown for any kind of content. So essentially you could claim defamation and then courts would say that uh, intermediaries should have act upon that notice. And then if 
if companies like Google didn't, what happened was uh, that person would, for example, take the issue to a court, and the court would say, well, you should have known better. You should have acted upon the very first notice you got, so therefore you're liable from the very first notice that you got, not because a judge is now has analyzed the issue. So uh, they tried to solve this, that situation in Marcus Seville, and I think they did, just to some extent. Now it's very, it's completely compatible, in my view, with the many other principles in which uh, companies are actually required to, uh, per private parties or the government is actually required to obtain a court order f to force companies to take content down, which is a very good sign of progress. There's still some stress, though, in to what extent that means, essentially, uh, on the identifiable uh, uh, aspect of what content, what kind of content is. We, we get lots of lawsuits here in which, for example, we get very broad and generic court orders saying, please remove, I don't know, for example, uh, the picture of this woman in a red dress. Please take down the video of the dancing bear or something, which is not exactly very helpful when you have so many, so much content going on, especially in platforms like YouTube who get like 400 hours of video per minute. So essentially, we have been trying to push that in the courts, explain that we need the URLs in order to take that kind of content down, but there's still some discussion whether they're necessary or not. I mean, recently we got some really good precedent on that. And finally, my final point would be, uh, there's still some lots of work to be done, especially now that uh, uh, Brazil is perceived as very, at least somewhat influential in these IG debates, and what we are perceiving is there's no dialogue with this uh, community with the local congresses across the region, and basically there's plenty of action to completely reform these recently enacted legislation. We are seeing plenty of people wanting to enact exceptions for these for, for this scenarios of intermediary liability, some of them pretty uh, consistent with international practices, just for example, in the case of revenge porn. Uh, notice and take down system is in place, for example. But now everybody wants to create their own exceptions for the general rule. So we're seeing, for example, politicians across the region saying things like, yeah, offenses to politicians should be also in the fast track system. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously not a very good model. Thank you, Marcel. Um, I'll pass on to uh, Nicola in a minute, but uh, um, first to reiterate what Georgie said at the start, that this was a civil society initiative at the outset. We didn't, um, we deliberately didn't decide to have a multi-stakeholder document on um, intermediary liability because we wanted to set a very high bar. Um, but having said that, uh, we are really gratified that many of the inter intermediaries have uh, come out in support of the document. And uh, for that reason, we are also opening it up to endorsement um, by industry and by industry associations. And um, so we are hopeful that we're going to be able to announce some fairly high profile endorsements from within um, the internet industry and the technical community to this document. Um, so that's really good news, and, and you should stay tuned uh, for more information about that soon. So, uh, Nicola. Yes. Since uh, we said that this was a bit more interactive, I thought I would jump in because uh, Marcel was speaking precisely about uh, principle two of the Manila principle, uh, whereby intermediaries cannot be required to restrict contests unless an order has been issued by an independent and impartial judicial authority. So here, I think there is uh, something to point out that you can interpret this principle uh, as um, referring to a property or to a liability rules. So for those who don't know the difference, uh, it's a standard distinction made in law economics where uh, property rules um, tries to secure uh, you know, the effectiveness of the protection of property. So it ensures that uh, the owner as an effective mechanism to um, prevent anyone from interfering with its own default entitlement. That's what we call property. So in this case, the entitlement will be that the intermediaries uh, should not be liable. And if, if we see this as a property rule, uh, this means that uh, it refers to any case in which a court or a, or a complainant can force the intermediaries to remove content. Liability is broader, so it refers also to cases where the intermediary will be liable uh, if he fails to remove content. So if you adopt this second perspective, uh, you are not referring anymore simply to the need for uh, judicial oversight and the, um, basically preventing the government from imposing a removal of content, but you are enshrining a, a safe harbor into the system where you say intermediaries can do whatever it wants until it um, 
it gets an order that says, okay, you have to remove content. Only at that point it will become uh, liable. So uh, I think on this, maybe uh, some clarification uh, could be perhaps interesting to make. Um, and if we adopt the second perspective, that is liability, what we are talking about, so not only property but a liability rule, then we are going close to the standard that was uh, adopted in Marco Civil. And I think uh, this is um, very good. On the other hand, it should be pointed out that, as Marcel mentioned, the Marco Civil also um, identifies two specific exceptions. Uh, one is um, in the case of copyright enforcement, and the other one is um, revenge porn. Uh, so in this case, I mean, if we want to export it to the global level, maybe we should uh, start thinking about uh, how to identify the exceptions to these principles because it's indeed particularly interesting. Uh, I didn't want to exhaust my intervention by this because I'm, this was a comment simply on the basis of uh, a paper I'm working on where I'm arguing that the Manila principles uh, can constitute one of the pillars for a global in internet intermediary liability regime. Uh, I'll speak later about my other projects. Thank you much, yes, we'll, we'll come back to you after we've heard uh, a few words from Giancarlo. Hello, I'm Giancarlo, and uh, I'm based at Stanford Law School, um, where uh, um, we have launched, and may, as some of you may know, the World Intermediate Liability Map. Uh, th this project uh, uh, showcases uh, um, information about uh, a legislation, case law, and uh, additional and, and, and pending bills and proposals uh, 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 connected to intermediate liability. Um, and what, I'm, what, I, what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do so is to um, uh, access, uh, so we, we are in a privileged, through, the, through that project we have been in a privileged position to, uh, uh, to consider developments in intermediary liability, recent developments. So what I'm trying to do is to um, uh, uh, assess the consistency of uh, uh, those developments with uh, the intermediary liability principle, at least with two of them. Um, and I, I'll try to be uh, as brief as possible. Uh, I, I'm going to look into uh, principle number one and principle number two. So um, whether we uh, intermediaries should be shielded from liability from third party content and what has been happening in terms of development and especially in terms of uh, uh, proactive monitoring obligation. And then uh, um, whether we should have or not, or whether we are having more or less uh, judicial review uh, for uh, uh, intermediary liability. Uh, in fact, uh, looking at uh, uh, the, the first point, uh, my feelings are mixed. Sure, we have on a side uh, uh, new safe harbors enacted. Uh, the market civil is a great example. We have uh, uh, a pending bill in Hong Kong uh, trying to introduce uh, a safe harbor regime as well. But at the same time, uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, we uh, have seen a proposal for uh, increasing and, and the, those proposals were mentioned, and maybe then later on we will uh, uh, open discussion. Uh, open a discussion on those. We have uh, the digital single market strategy for Europe, which is uh, uh, planning the introduction of enhanced obligation, especially in terms of uh, um, introducing a duty of care for intermediaries uh, uh, and enhance a duty of care that, uh, um, in, in case uh, for responsibility uh, for enhanced responsibility for dealing with illegal content, such as especially child pornography terrorist materials uh, and the content that infringes upon intellectual property rights. At the same time, uh, you know, confirming this trend, uh, the uh, German coalition agreement of 2014 has uh, um, uh, foreseen the uh, possible introduction of an answer obligation for uh, uh, intermediaries. It is already law, uh, the Spanish copyright reform, which has uh, increased uh, liability of intermediaries, uh, especially introduce introducing a notion of secondary liability for copyright infringement in the, um, in the uh, uh, Spanish uh, copyright law and uh, introducing uh, uh, obligation of disclosure of identity of uh, uh, potential infringers, alleged infringers uh, for uh, intermediaries. Um, as far as uh, monitoring obligations are concerned, uh, although we generally have a, um, we have a general principle of no monitoring obligation in Europe, here the trend is concerning as well. And, uh, 
uh, most likely in a, a contrast with what the uh, Manila principles um, are telling us. Um, at least uh, in, in, in most of the European national cases, though we have a, a great important exception uh, in the Belen case in Argentina, but we have a number of cases uh, in Europe starting from um, the so-called allo streaming decision in France. I won't have time to um, um, detail the uh, facts of the cases, but I will just uh, give you uh, names and then we can discuss it later. Um, then a, a, a couple of the so-called uh, Max Mosley cases, which the, the allo streaming cases dealing in fact with copyright infringement and uh, the listing requested uh, to Google, Yahoo and uh, Microsoft in France uh, for uh, websites uh, streaming uh, uh, illegal uh, movies. Um, the Max Mosley case are uh, dealing with the privacy infringement uh, and uh, in um, both these cases, in fact, uh, the Mass Mosley case was decided both in French, in uh, in, uh, in French, in France, and uh, in uh, and in Germany, the court uh, imposed uh, uh, proactive monitoring obligation on uh, 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 search engines. At the same time, uh, in Italy, we had a mixed uh, a mixed uh, decision with uh, uh, proactive monitoring uh, decided at least in one case, or and another case which, in fact. Uh, um, as, uh, as, as uh, confirming that there is no monitoring obligation. At the same time, um, we have in Brazil the DAFA decision, which was in fact decided uh, before the Marcos Civil, but has uh, um, applied uh, a strict liability principle and uh, enforced proactive monitoring. As you may know, we have a very important decision from uh, the European Court of Justice, the Delphi decision, which have in fact uh, um, adopted a proactive monitoring obligation for, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for intermediaries. The great exception is uh, the, uh, the Belen decision from the Supreme Court of Argentina in which the court has in fact sa uh, said that, uh, um, court, that, that there is no monitoring obligation for companies uh, and that, that in fact uh, um, unless uh, uh, in a number of specific cases, uh, um, notices must be decided by a court uh, rather than uh, directly dealt with by um, companies. Uh, the second important trend, and I'll get through it uh, uh, very fast, is related to, um, is related to um, the uh, second principle, which in fact uh, would seek for judicial uh, enforcement of uh, any intermediary liability um, uh, uh, decision. Uh, in fact, uh, we really see something else happening right now. We see the emergence of so-called administrative enforcement, and I'll just detail to you uh, all the uh, administrative agencies that are dealing with a miscellaneous array of uh, infringements uh, spanning from a copyright infringement to um, uh, uh, defamation and, uh, and, and privacy infringement. We have in Italy the uh, AGCOM, which was empowered the uh, communication authority with online copyright, uh, with, with, with dealing with online copyright infringement. In Spain, we have uh, the second section of the Copyright Commission, which was empowered with uh, enforcement of online copyright infringement. In Turkey, we have the famous uh, uh, president of telecommunication and communication, which was empowered with administrative enforcement of any type of uh, 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 violation of personality and privacy rights. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, in Russia, the Roskomnadzor, which is dealing with a vast array of uh, um, different infringement and can uh, order blocking orders uh, uh, on an administrative basis. We have in South Korea the uh, uh, Korea Communication Commission and the Korea Communication Standards Commission, which are still acting with uh, applying administrative enforcement, uh, so no judicial review for uh, um, targeting intermediaries and uh, uh, imposing their obligation of blocking or deleting content. In Iran, we have the Supreme Council of Cyberspace and the Committee for Determining Instances of Criminal Web Content. In India, we have the, commit the Committee the rule seven of uh, the IT rules. Uh, and finally, um, and then in Venezuela, we have uh, uh, the Commission Nacional de Telecomunicaciones de, Vene uh, de Venezuela, CONTEL, which is uh, blocking and uh, taking down material on an administrative basis. And finally, in China,
China. We have, uh, we have uh, very recently uh, the National Copyright Administration of China, which wants to implement the same mechanism for uh, copyright uh, um, for, for uh, um, uh, enforcement of online copyright infringement as it was applied by the um, uh, Italian AGCOM and uh, the Spanish uh, uh, Intellectual Property Commission. So um, I will stop here, then maybe we could discuss if there is a few minutes what we could do in order to tackle the problem of extrajudicial application of, uh, of, uh, of uh, intermediate liability uh, decision because this is probably one of the important emerging trends. But uh, according to uh, our mapping of the trends, uh, uh, the developments may be uh, inconsistent with what the Manila principles uh, are asking for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giancarlo. Uh, we have a hand in the audience, but uh, before we go to questions, um, I'll just make a note that uh, although we appear to be running out of time, the timer up there shows we have a 90-minute session, although we're supposed to have a 60-minute session. So if anyone would like to stay a few minutes after the hour, we can carry on the discussion. And in that case, we don't have to rush so much. We don't have to take the full 90 minutes, but does anyone mind if we want run a little bit late? No? Okay. Um, so in that case, I can hand back, uh, well, firstly, thank you to Giancarlo for raising some very important issues, um, and it shows how timely the Manila principles are in that uh, there are, all of a sudden, it seems a rash of moves to impose duties of care, um, proactive monitoring obligations, uh, the Delphi case was handed down, um, so I think this is absolutely the right time for this initiative. Um, and uh, I would like to hand back, before we open for questions, um, to Niccolo for his um, additional remarks. Um, so on one point, I wanted to um, confirm um, what Giancarlo said uh, in the sense that I think we also need to look into uh, extrajudicial mechanisms um, for inf enforcement that are increasingly adopted by intermediaries. I mean, the Manila principle don't address this squarely uh, as part of the principles, and if you have very uh, very strict principles regarding, for example, the need for a judicial order uh, in or before the content is removed. The risk is that they are going to switch to a parallel framework, and this is what we see in many countries. Can I mention just this? Uh, because I think maybe I, I expressed myself uh, okay. wrongly. Uh, you talking about extrajudicial, which is uh, absolutely, but I, I probably made a mistake if I, if I said extrajudicial. I, I want to refer to extraterritorial application. That's uh, one of the trends that, uh, that is emerging, and we should. We should take tackling and, and, and discuss within the Manila principle. So, but we, bo we need both uh, extrajudicial and extraterritorial, discussion on extraterritorial application. Okay, thank you. Um, so going now um, on the projects that uh, I'm involved in that uh, are related to the Manila principles. Uh, first of all, uh, as we are at the IGF, I should mention I'm um, one of the coordinators of the Dynamic Coalition on Platform Responsibility. Uh, which has as an objective uh, the development of uh, model contractual clauses um, that um, different kinds of platforms can adopt to show that they have a responsible behavior towards the protection of uh, the rights of their users. In particular, we started with uh, freedom of expression, due process, and privacy, and we developed a set of uh, recommendations in terms of service and human rights. Um, so this has gone uh, uh, forward uh, a little bit in parallel with another project that we started at the Fundação Getúlio Vargas um, last October. Uh, and uh, this project is called Terms of Service and Human Rights. And we looked into actually how the companies are um, respecting the rights to privacy, freedom of expression, and due process. So we develop a methodology based on human rights standards and we score the companies according to the level of the protection that they offer under each of these aspects. And um, I, I think that in respect to the Manila principles, how they relate to this, uh, there are a couple of um, points that are particularly fitting. Uh, so th the last one that was also mentioned by Rebecca, who has a similar project, is the one that uh, transparency and accountability must be built into laws and content restriction policies and practices. Um, in particular, there is one of these uh, sub-principles that addresses intermediaries and says that they should publish their content restriction 
policies online in clear language and accessible formats and keep them updated as they evolve, notifying users of changes when applicable. So here um, we, we have, a, of course, recognized the impact that a change of policy can have on the rights of users, so we require meaningful notice before uh, any change, any significant change is made. Um, and with respect to clarity, we have the policy that whenever the terms of service are either uh, incomplete or unclear, vague, like for example, they say we may do this or we may not, uh, in that case, this can be interpreted to the detriment of the user. So, so in the terms of service and human rights project, we uh, rank the company down. We score them uh, in a negative way when they have this vague type of language. Um, on the dynamic condition platform responsibility, the objective is to have these model contractual clauses um, that are pointing towards specific aspects that need to be clear and transparent as the, the Manila principle suggests. So we direct, in a way, companies to the right uh, parts of the terminal service that need to be clear. And this, the last uh, um, principle that I want to mention is uh, principle number four. Um, laws and content restriction orders and practices must comply with the test of necessity and proportionality. Here um, we have developed in the dynamic coalition platform responsibility a specific notion of legitimate law, uh, which is a bit of a, of a creative invention to uh, refer to situation where maybe the law is not um, perfectly consistent at the national level with the international human rights standard. And this can happen from a substantive perspective when the law you know, uh, requires the, the intermediaries to reach too much, to restrict too much, for example, the whole YouTube ca channel when uh, only one video is um, infringing. And so this was a way in which we incorporated these Manila principles, I, I thought. Um, and then on, with regard to the fact that any restriction of content should be limited to the specific content at issue, also again, we, uh, we recommend in the recommendation on terms of service and human rights that any restriction of content uh, that is permanent should only be adopted as last resort. So at the first level, the intermediary, if it is required to remove content, it should not completely erase it from the system, but at least uh, you know, wait until the decision is finalized, it has undergone judicial review, or uh, the time for uh, accessing judicial review is uh, terminated. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, the timer has, does now say we have 15 seconds left. However, my, uh, my colleague Jody has gone to the back and confirmed we can overrun by a little bit, um, but there is another uh, session coming later, so we'll uh, wrap up in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Um, it's great to hear about these other um, endeavours that are aligned with the Manila principles. and. Um, just, I should note that if you are doing any work on intermediary liability issues and you don't already have a platform for publishing that, please do consider the Manila Principles website as a possible platform because we're very open to discussing with you um, hosting other material there. Um, and I, so let's open it for questions. I, I saw a couple of hands before. Uh, I think the uh, we have a microphone here. If you could come to the front to give your question. Um, second will be Pranesh, and then the gentleman uh, who's coming forward now. So the, those are the first three. So why don't you uh, line up, and uh, thank you. Hi, it's not exactly a question. I'm from Argentina. I'm a colleague, not because I work in the same place, but I work in Asociación por los Derechos Civiles. My name is Valeria Milanes. And I, a colleague from Eduardo, of Eduardo Bertoni, so may, I, Maybe I can share with you what is happening in Argentina regarding two Manila principles. We had, like Giancarlo said, the president in court, uh, Rodriguez Belen, uh, which was a very important one, a very important one, but we don't have a still law. But we are uh, speaking about Manila principles in Congress, in academic environment, and Manila principles are having very good reception in legal environments mostly. So um, there is a lot of work to do because we have a very, um, the, the legal community is still uh, taking 
old uh, thinking about responsibility or uh, liability, sorry, but we think that we have a chance because in academic environments, Vanilla Principles is being taught. So we think it's very good. I just want to share with you that, and I have a meeting at 12, so I say goodbye. Excellent, thank you. And uh, please, if you can email us uh, some of those details, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bobby Vedi. I'm a film producer from India. Uh, my question is a little amateur, I think, because I'm really getting grips on this. But uh, if if the Mena principles require a court order, then in a country like India, it's totally uh, useless because uh, g getting copyright material off the, uh, off the web with a court order is uh, locking the stable door after the sort of horses run away and run away for miles. So how does one tackle it at the legal end over here? I mean, at the moment, we do have some kind of police action, so we can stop sites. But uh, if we were to follow this principle of having a legal order, it would never happen. Anyone want to respond to that from the steering committee? Or? OK, let's take some more questions. Then we'll, we'll make a note to respond to that. So thank you for your question. Uh, sure, you're next in line anyway, Pranesh, so go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, first, I'll, I'll, a quick response. This is Pranish Prakash from the Center for Internet and Society in India. And uh, Mr. Bedi was also at, uh, uh, he missed a presentation that I made at uh, the Jawaharlal Nehru University just uh, around 10 days ago, as a matter of fact, unfortunately, where uh, I spoke about court orders and private enforcement of copyright in India and how numerous websites, including goo.gl, which is the Google URL shortener, have actually been blocked due to copyright complaints. By, and, and, and so there's a complete lack of accountability. There are hundreds of websites which without an iota of proof, without a shred of proof as to their being copyright infringing, have been blocked in India, and the, uh, including Metacafe, Vimeo.com, and others, without a single court order. Now, how would you bring about accountability into a process like this remains a difficult question. And, and these aren't hypotheticals. This has actually happened right, in India. Secondly, uh, the question that I have is uh, one about the lack of clarity, uh, and I would love if, if one of you would take it up, about inter what is an intermediary here? Because uh, there's a, almost an assumption in this document, in the Manila Principles, that intermediaries are large companies, whereas they needn't actually be large companies. Even individuals, for instance, may be intermediaries. Now, the transparency and accountab accountability framework that is required might actually be quite onerous for, for individuals, and, and they might not actually have policies. So how can we shoehorn a one-size-fits-all system towards intermediary liability when there are so many different kinds of intermediaries? Next question, and then we'll respond. Uh, this, um, uh, I'm Danny O'Brien, I'm from uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and this is just a, a comment r rather than a question. I think Rebecca's uh, point earlier uh, uh, that many of you have touched on about um, uh, removals due to terms of service is, is, an, is an important one. And uh, I just wanted to mention that I think in, uh, within the next week we'll be launching a site called onlinecensorship.org, which is an attempt to um, do what uh, chilling effects did to highlight government takedowns, where it'll enable people to report um, um, their removal of their accounts or content for apparent terms of service violations, and hopefully we'll, from that we'll be able to get some data and see um, uh, if we can introduce or encourage some transparency to this, because I think we're all agreed that it's, it's a bit of a, a murky um, uh, uh, environment right now. But thank you. Uh, we'll hold the next two questions. We will get to you, um, but we'll just answer the questions that we've had first. Um, 
Also, uh, on onlinecensorship.org, uh, if you go to the website now, you'll see a different website, which is going to be replaced by a brand new sparkly website very soon. So um, if you're under-impressed by the existing website, don't worry at all. Um, so I think Gabrielle had an answer to one of the first questions. Answer uh, to um, the gentleman about how impractical it would be in India to wait for a court order. I think it's important to remember that the Manila principles aim to set a high standard. And in this sense, we were aiming to have the highest standard possible in terms of the person ultimately, or the body ultimately deciding whether content is unlawful should be a court. So that's why we went with the court nonetheless. I think it's also important to remember in practice that the court order is in relation to the obligation of the intermediary to restrict access to content. In practice, the intermediary would still have its terms and conditions and that shouldn't prevent the individual from reporting content and hopefully give details as to why he or she thinks that the content is in breach of the terms of service. So there would still be this avenue, but in that particular case, then the approach would be different since it would be up to the intermediary to decide whether or not there's a breach of their terms and conditions. Now, what we're also advocating for in the Manila principles is for the intermediary to be as transparent as possible in relation to its terms and conditions so that individuals know what to expect in terms of what's permissible and what's not on the platform and to make sure that there are also redress mechanisms which will lead us into um, the territory of uh, Pranesh's question about um, then how practical it is for intermediaries to um, put in place these mechanisms, but perhaps someone else on the panel wants to respond to that. Maybe I could, or would, uh, um, so uh, when we were drafting the Manila Principles, uh, we did at the outset consider the different sizes of the intermediaries, and I remember it being said, um, uh, that we even wanted to cover someone who may host an open Wi-Fi hotspot in their house or have a bulletin board on motorcycles that they run from their bedroom, that sort of thing. Um, but the extent to which the obligations are applicable to different classes of intermediaries is a little hard to discern from the text of the principles themselves. One of the hints you can get is where it says should rather than must. Um, that is where we give ourselves some leeway to um, apply different obligations to smaller intermediaries than larger intermediaries. Um, so should is really uh, more of a, um, uh, a best standard to aim for uh, for those intermediaries who have the resources. Um, we uh, have two more questions, so let's take those and then we'll close off the questions there and uh, uh, turn back to the panel for answers. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Michiel Steltman, Director of the Digital Infrastructure Association in the Netherlands. One question refer, refers to uh, Pranesh's point about the scope of intermediaries again. In the Netherlands, we, um, um, we have some concerns about the broadness of the definitions of intermediaries. In the Netherlands, we've, um, the Scientific Council for uh, Government Policy has introduced a concept called the public core of the internet, which should be excluded from any interventions anyway for every, any type of content, including internet exchanges, uh, the, the routing system, DNS, uh, carriers, and ISPs, which means that the communications should be just net neutral, but all other forms of intermediaries, hosting companies, uh, search engines, uh, cloud providers, etc., where the content is hosted, uh, would definitely apply, um, would definitely be in scope for intermediaries for the Manila principles. So I'm curious ab about your vision and position on that, on making uh, differentiation or distinction between types of intermediaries that should be left alone and the ones that are um, that should adhere to, pr to the principles. Yeah. yeah, I'll be brief. Alex Gakuru from Kenya. I probably you said it, but I missed it. But how do you uh, ensure that copyright does not become the tool for censorship in the sense that abuse of the takedowns? Uh, on grounds of copyright has become a new tool of uh, enforcing censorship and what mechanisms are there to ensure that intermediaries are not being made the unsuspecting uh, partners in enforcing that censorship. Thank you. Thank you. Those are two very good questions. Uh, let's take one last question. Hello. 
I'm a little person. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm Raizu Ribarri from Venezuela, Universidad de los Andes. I want to thank Dr. Frosio for uh, uh, mentioning Venezuela's case. Uh, last uh, year we had uh, more than a hundred, a thousand uh, websites blog by administrative procedures from the regulator entity, which is Conatel. But I want to point out that also our law, the, our media law, establish heavy fines for third parties just for publishing uh, news. That in our case is very uh, uh, um, worrying. Uh, for example, if we have, um, we are confronting a media landscape hegemony. So people in our country are trying to go to the digital sphere to get out our voices. So, for example, we have uh, more than 30 media di directors that are being prosecuted because being uh, published in their websites um, um, news that uh, were being published in Europe, for example, regarding our authorities. So it's a very concerning uh, issue, this one. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's turn back to the panel. Uh, Nicola, I believe you have a response to that uh, observation about the different classes of intermediaries. Yes. Uh, in fact, this is a recurring question. Um, so th what the gentleman referred to is um, basically technical intermediaries. And uh, um, the principle that is usually applicable in this case is the one of mere conduit. So the intermediary is not liable, uh, provided that it does not initiate the, the transmission, uh, it does not select the receiver of contact, and, and it does not select or modify the information that is transmitted. Um, the uh, joint uh, declaration by the three uh, rapporteurs on freedom of expression in 2011 um, recommended all regimes of intermediate liability to add this principle ensuring in the law, but it also suggested to broaden this principle uh, beyond mere conduit, mere technical intermediaries. Um, so I just think in this respect, the Manila principles take, takes a step forward um, by following that suggestion. Um, and this is something to be praised. On the other hand, uh, it is true that there are different classes of intermediaries who uh, look more in depth into the type of content that is transmitted. And I think uh, also connecting with the previous question about size, uh, we should recognize that the powers and responsibilities of these entities are not the same. Um, so in Europe, for example, uh, we are starting to uh, adopt a more differentiated approach uh, with regard to data protection law. The new general data protection regulation aims, has some higher burdens for uh, data controllers who are um, at a, a higher uh, size, uh, higher uh, impact on the rights of users. Um, so in this respect, I think what could be helpful is to look at um, something that is called the, the um, fiduciary duty that um, is a theory that is being argued by mainly two scholars, uh, Jack Balkin from Yale and uh, uh, Jonathan Zittern from Harvard. And it refers to the idea that these entities, you know, um, they have a duty with regard to the information that we entrust them with. However, the, the scope of this duty, of course, depends on the expectation that we can uh, set on these different players and the size and the type of activity that they uh, perform, um, of course, has a bearing on how broad our expectation can be. I just have to wrap up, but uh, just very briefly, um, I'll go to the panel for the last two questions. There was one on copyright uh, enforcement or censorship through copyright and one on Venezuela. So uh, go ahead. <coughs> Real, oops, sorry. Uh, real quickly, only on the f other question on the intermediaries, just wanted to highlight what Brazil did as a, as a legal solution. Essentially, uh, if you're an intermediary, no matter what kind, as Pranesh pointed out, you can really be an individual, be considered an intermediary, then the protection of the law applies to you immediately. If you're a commercial enterprise, though, then you have extra duties, for example, on data retention, on trying to figure out who the actual user who posted the content is. So that's the distinction that they drew on the legislation. Uh, not saying it's a good model, just saying it's what exists. Uh, on the copyright issue, uh, as my colleague said, essentially 
as a practical matter, uh, notice and take down regimes for copyright are pretty much what being observed around the world, regardless of the existence of a local DMCA. That's what companies tend to, to t tend to do, and the reason is very simple. Companies are in a very interesting position in which they get pressure from both sides. Essentially, on the idea of private takedowns, what usually happens is uh, we get pressure to be as fast as, as possible on taking down content from a victims of the supposedly online wrongdoing perspective, and on the other hand, we get also get the same pressure from the user who actually posted the content. So it's exactly why initiatives like the Manila Principles, who try to influence policy across the world on these ideas, are so welcome, and I think Thank you guys for all the hard work you've been done. On that note, uh, thank you very much everyone for coming. I um, am disturbed by the number of laptops that I can see that don't have Manila Principles stickers on them. <laughs> so you need to get your Manila Principles stickers at the back before you leave. Um, thanks again and uh, we'll see you, uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks again.